so it's six o'clock i think uh, we can start the students will join gradually uh, so greetings and welcome to gd goenka uplearn academy uh, just a second vaishali i hope you're recording yes fine so uh, Greetings and welcome to GD Goenka Uplearn Academy in association with GD Goenka University. I'm very thrilled and excited sharing this platform with all of you. My name is Dr. Abha and I am heading School of Education, GD Goenka University, Gurgaon. I thank you all for, uh, for taking part in uh, this uh, uh, webinar on the pandemic remote learning uh, and online learning in schools. We will be recording the presentation and uh, uh, as usual, we will be posting it on uh, School of Education uh, Facebook page. Uh, for the Q&A session, you are requested to post the questions in the comment box. It's my privilege to introduce you to Dr. Michael K. Barber. He is an associate professor in uh, instructional design for the College of Education and Health Sciences at Toro University, California. He has been involved with K-12 uh, distance online and blended learning in Canada, the United States, and several international jurisdictions for over two decades. Michael's research focuses on the effective design, delivery, and support of K-12 distance online and blended learning, and how regulation, governance, and policy can impact effective distance online and blended learning environments. Thank you and welcome, Professor Barber, to GD Goenka Aplan Academy. We would like to know more about remote learning and the future of online learning in schools. Over to you, Professor Barber. Well, thank you for that introduction and thank you for the invite to speak today. It's uh, um, I, one of the, I guess, silver linings of the, the pandemic is that yes. it, it's allowed folks to be able to engage uh, across the globe on topics like this. So I've um, rather enjoyed over the last 18 months, the, the ability to, to learn about contexts that are uh, unfamiliar to, my, to me at the moment and, and, and to really engage with, with folks here. So this is a, a pleasure. Um, so I'm gonna talk, most of my talk is actually gonna be focused upon, I think the pandemic and the remote learning side. I'll touch on the future of online learning in schools. Uh, at the end, and I'm hoping to leave a lot of time for questions. And I apologize in advance for any sort of ill-formed thoughts that that come out over the next hour. Um, it's 5:30 a.m. here, uh, so I've only been up for about a half hour, and uh, I'm only about a third of the way through my first cup of coffee. So uh, things really haven't kicked in yet. Um, but I, I wanted to start with sort of taking a step back, uh, and I want to take a step back for a couple of reasons. Uh, most folks don't realize that distance learning has been used within the, the, the school sector, the, the K-12 system now for well over a century. And there's a lot of stuff that we've learned during that period. Um, you know, the, the first distance programs in North America began around 1906 with the, the old correspondence uh, model of education. Um, in the, the 20s, we saw uh, the educational radio start to, to take off, particularly, well, I guess it's sort of a misnomer, um, particularly in the Midwest, uh, countries like Australia uh, invested heavily into um, the educational radio. In fact, there are still multiple schools of the air that exist uh, in that country. Um, and for that matter, if you look back to the correspondence model, that's still the dominant model of, of distance learning that you see in countries like New Zealand. Um, instructional television began in, in the late 50s, early 60s, 61 um, in the US. Uh, it was a little bit early in other jurisdictions. It seemed to have its greatest uptake in a lot of the, the Asian countries. Um, didn't get as much in uh, interest in North America. Um, telematics, uh, which uh, you can see up there in the, the 80s, which was, um, I guess, a precursor to what we have here today with our electronic classrooms that we've got, you know, where you had a, a speaker box in the middle of the room with a bunch of little microphones attached to it that you actually had to push a button on to, to get to work. and. Um, there was a single computer that was like a screenwriter 
uh, that whatever the teacher wrote showed up in, in the distance sites. Uh, that got a lot of uptake in places like Canada. Several Australian uh, territories also invested heavily into it. And the first online programs that we know of, at least in North America, actually the first one was a school called Laurel Springs, uh, which is a private school here in California. Uh, they started off in 1991. Um, shortly after that, you saw a lot of public schools starting to get created in the late 90s. And, and by the mid-2000s, um, most states in the U.S. Were, were offering some kind of online learning uh, 2006 was when the first U.S. state actually required an online learning experience in order to graduate from high school. Um, similarly, trajectory in Canada, um, it's around the same time, 95, is when the first online programs in New Zealand got started. Uh, we saw the early 90s places like Hong Kong and Singapore uh, start to get heavily invested in this. So when you're looking at sort of the formal use of distance education, you know, there's a rich history of it. And one of, I guess, the biggest uh, faults within the field, particularly within practitioners, is they assume that sort of each of these dates are a unique milestone that begins something that had never happened before. And because of that, they fail to sort of build upon uh, the lessons. Uh, that we had learned. You know, we've at this point now had 115 years of teaching adolescents and, and younger learners uh, at a distance using correspondence education. But if you pick up any journal article that focuses upon online or blended learning today, you'll never see a reference in there from earlier than 1995. Um, it's almost as if, you know, that first um, at that stage, it would have been 91 or 89 years of, of history that we have with this knowledge that we've gained from this sort of independent distance learning just ceased to exist or didn't matter. Um, and it's actually been one of the, the shortcomings of the field, both from a research standpoint, but also a practitioner standpoint. Now, in, in terms of why I wanted to start with this, it's actually sort of two reasons. One, because this is the formal trajectory of the history of, of K-12 distance learning. But if you look at the last 18 months, you would see headlines like this, and this, and this, and this. And in all of these instances, it's treating what's happened over the last 18 months as if it was just part of this timeline, that it's something that was formal, it was well thought out, that it was planned and prepared for. And I think all of us in the field, particularly those of us that have been in, in a classroom um, in the past 18 months, realize that this isn't sort of that formal, planned, prepared trajectory. Um, shortly into the pandemic, uh, a group of uh, my colleagues um, led by Chuck Hodges produced a report, and I'll drop the or link in the um, chat, uh, produced an article that uh, in Educause Review that looked at the difference between emergency remote teaching and online learning. And they were one of the first, uh, not the first, but one of the first to use the phrase emergency remote teaching. And it really was something that, at least from an academic standpoint, took off in the field in terms of, of um, how we, we look at it. Um, I actually got Chuck and his colleagues, as well as a couple of other folks, to uh, basically make a K-12 version of that article. And if you go to this website, you can pick up a copy of that report, as well as several others uh, that come out of uh, that particular initiative. And it's the um, State of the Nation K-12 e-learning in Canada initiative that uh, I run. Um, but essentially what we did was because the Educause Review article was an open access article, um, we engaged, and you'll see the five of the last six people there, the original authors, um, along with some other folks that were writing in the field, to basically make a K-12 version of this. And when you're looking at the differences between these, it, it, it's quite distinct. So they describe um, online learning in, in this sort of manner. And you don't necessarily have to read the entire definition, but if you pull out some of the key words that are there, and I've made the key words here, at least what I think are the key words in, in blue uh, as you're looking at this, and I think I bolded them as well. 
Um, but you're, you're seeing a, 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 a trend in terms of the types of words that are used, purposeful, systematic, careful, best suited, um, purposeful, again, strengths and limitations, careful, appropriate, um, effective. You know, it's something that you can tell that, you know, online learning and that trajectory that I showed on that timeline, they were all things that were sat down and people thought about them beforehand. And they had the opportunity to look at each of the, the, the mediums that they were using and the tools available in that medium to determine, you know, what are things that we can do in this environment and what are things that we're limited by in this environment and how can we um, preference the affordances that were provided while still trying to overcome some of the limitations or address the limitations of these. How do we prepare our teachers to be able to teach in these environments, um, not just to be able to use the tools, but to be able to use the tools to teach effectively. And uh, I make that distinction because it's an important distinction that oftentimes in schools of education, we don't make that um, that that secondary leap. We, you know, we teach our incoming teachers how to use the tool, and in some cases, how to troubleshoot some of the common problems that might experience or might be experienced in the tool. But we tend not to spend a lot of time focused upon how do you teach using that tool. Um, so we, 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 if you look at sort of the um, uh, you know, the work of, of, of Mishner and Kush, uh, Kirshner, um, that idea of TPAC, you know, we, we teach the technology knowledge. We don't teach the technological pedagogical knowledge uh, that is required uh, to use those tools. And if you contrast that with sort of what's happened in the past 18 months, particularly what happened in the spring of 2020, so when the, the pandemic first began, um, Chuck and his colleagues, um, Charles Hodges and his colleagues, uh, used the term emergency remote teaching. And, and this is how they described it in the article. And again, I'll highlight the specific words that I think are critical in this particular definition. You know, so the idea is that it's a temporary shift and it's only due to the crisis circumstance that we've got. We're only using remote teaching um, because we have to, you know, otherwise we'd be doing it face to face. And we plan on going back to face to face as soon as the crisis or emergency uh, is over. It's, it's not designed to be a robust educational system. It's just designed to provide temporary access and something that's quick to set up and reasonably reliably available during the crisis or emergency. And again, you sort of see that contrast between something that's well thought out and something that's sort of done on the fly simply because we have the ability to do this. So this is all being sort of talked about in, in, in the lighter, or I guess, reflective of the pandemic and what's been happening. And while it's important to sort of use that as one of our measures, this is not the only time that we've seen this kind of thing happen, um, not just in, in, in sort of the history of formalized K-12 education, but in, in recent years. Um, you know, so if we go back a bit, and look from a more historical context, um, you know, the one that the coronavirus, uh, COVID-19, is often compared to from a pandemic perspective is the, the Spanish flu of, of 1918 and 1919. And we saw distance education uh, at the time. It was primarily uh, correspondence education, but also, as you can see from that, that first example up there, which was a um, an article that appeared in 74 million, which is a... a publication in the U.S. that primarily focuses upon um, and promotes, to be perfectly honest with you, um, educational reform from sort of a neoliberal perspective. But, you know, they outlined how during the last pandemic and really throughout the history of the 20th century, how the telephone had been used as an educational device for folks that weren't able to access um, education in the classroom. If you look at the polio epidemic in the late 1940s in New Zealand, um, the correspondence school there was used as the primary method for uh, weathering that particular pandemic uh, for them, or epidemic, I guess it was, because it wasn't worldwide. It was regional in nature. Um, they did use some educational radio as well, but um, it was mainly 
um, the uh, correspondence. Um, you know, here in North America, and I know this is probably not as, as big an issue for you folks over there, but um, we lose a fair amount of, of time due to snow days here in North America. I'm originally from Canada, and my own home province of Newfoundland and Labrador, um, actually only a month and a half before they had to shut down the entire system because of the pandemic, um, the school system in, in my home province was actually closed for two weeks because they had about 70 inches, actually it was 77 inches of snow that fell on them in like a 72 hour period. And it took them two weeks to just dig out the, 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 the city and um, be able to you know, well, move about freely after that. Um, so there's been a long conversation in North America, particularly in the northern states and throughout Canada, about the use of, of online learning and distance learning uh, for short-term school closures, such as snow days. Um, New Zealand, uh, particularly in this, uh, the, the Julie Mackey et al. Uh, information comes in the wake of the Christchurch earthquakes in 2010 and 2011. And, um, you know, they used blended and online learning uh, during that period of time as a way to accommodate both the times that school were shut down altogether. But then as students started to come back, and I, I was fortunate enough that I was doing my sabbatical at the time, and I was in New Zealand, so uh, I was able to, to be a little bit of a part of this. Um, but roughly half the schools in Christchurch were condemned. Uh, they were red stickered because they were unsafe to, to enter. Um, so you all of a sudden now had, um, you know, 100 percent of the population of students, but only 50 percent of the space because 50 percent of the buildings uh, were not usable. Uh, so trying to come up with creative ways to accommodate those students and to use the facilities and uh, was something that I, um, online learning played a big part of. And even just in recent history, this notion of using online learning as a way to deal with, with pandemics and epidemics isn't a, a new concept. Um, you know, we're at the stage now where it's a you know, dozen years ago when Latcham and Jung first documented uh, what they were doing in Hong Kong um, with respect to remote teaching uh, during an H1N1 outbreak. Um, Alpert did the same thing when he looked at the even earlier in 20, uh, 2003 in Hong Kong due to SARS. Um, we've seen examples in Bolivia. And I mean, these aren't necessarily all developed countries. I understand places like Hong Kong and Singapore are small city states that are highly connected and, and have a, a great deal of bandwidth. But a place like Bolivia isn't. And if we can figure out how to do it in places like Bolivia, um, I, I think that's you know an indication that with the right planning and preparation that we could do this in other jurisdictions, um, which is actually one of the reasons why when you look at the North American response to it, particularly the US response to the past 18 months, it's been particularly disappointing. Now, the one thing I'll, I'll mention here is you'll notice that all of these in recent times, both in terms of things like earthquakes and snow days and other natural disasters, plus these you know, pandemics and epidemics that you're seeing here, all focus upon online learning. And I think that actually is one of the, the things that has made the North American response a little stifled, um, the fact that they've focused solely upon the current technologies. Um, if you look, and, and this is actually, it comes out of a, uh, a, a journal called the Journal of Emergency Preparedness, which I didn't know existed before the pandemic, but I guess a lot of us didn't know uh, a lot about emergency preparedness in general prior to the pandemic. Uh, so this is is an interesting, um, you know, one. But if you look at the list of things that they describe here as being um, things that you need to prepare for and things that you need to be ready for. And, the, you know, this is basically published four years before the pandemic began. Um, but issues around connectivity and bandwidth, issues around getting devices into the hands of kids, issues around making sure teachers are prepared to use the technology and use it for teaching, making decisions about how you're going to deliver the instruction. Is it going to be online or is it going to use other types of modalities? Are you going to have teachers create their own content or curate existing content? Do you buy vendor 
uh, based content or is it homegrown in nature? You know, these are all things that we've struggled with over the last 18 months that folks have been telling us for quite some time that, you know, we need to be concerned about. And it, it's not just something that we need to be concerned about in terms of the current situation, although the current situation is obviously one that um, makes a big deal because if you look at what we know about pandemic and, and just, you know, the conversation we we're having before we began, you know, pandemics come in waves and, you know, how those waves look and the effect and impact of those waves that we have, it, it's not something that we necessarily know how it's going to play out. The only thing that we can say is that it's largely based upon what happens on our end. Um, you know, so how quickly we were able to come up with a, a vaccine, the amount of, of vaccine distribution that we can have, the number to use the, the lingo that they use in North America, the number of shots in the arms that they can actually get out. Um, you know, my home province uh, has 84 percent of the, the population has had a first shot and almost 70 percent of the population has had both shots. Um, we have places in the U.S. where there is only um, in the high 30% range. Even the best places in the U.S. are into the 70% range. Um, you know, and that's just in Canada and the U.S. If you look at a lot of places in the world, um, you know, they're 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 dying for more vaccine, um, literally, and. Um, that allows for, you know, these variants of interest and variants of concern to rise, which could, you know, impact how these bumps look. Um, the other thing that it's worth noting is that if you look at the history of pandemics, um, typically speaking, we've usually been good for a major pandemic about once or twice every single century. And if you look at the very bottom of that um, chart there, one of the things you'll note is that since 2000, so just in the first fifth, so the first 20 years of this particular century we're in now, so we're a fifth of the way through, we've had five global pandemics already. Now, obviously the first four weren't at the level that we've seen with COVID-19, but the fact that, um, the, the fact that we have, you know, had so much of that means that this is something that's going to become more commonplace. You know, and if it's not due to a global pandemic, it's a natural disaster that's, you know, climate change induced or what have you. You know, the way in which we interact with our environment is causing more disruptions in general. Um, so when we look at this sort of model of how we respond, and this one was put together specifically around COVID-19, but it's a good model, I think, for us to think about in terms of how we respond in these crisis circumstances in general. You know, so phase one is, you know, the that initial phase when, you know, the things just automatically go wrong. Right, so this is March and April of, of 2020 that you're looking at in phase one. You know, how do we get kids um, to, you know, just how do we, we, we continue to educate kids? Um, as that phase starts to move forward and you start to get devices into hands and you start to get teachers actually providing some continuity of instruction, you move into phase two. And that's really where we ended in most cases, the, the 2019, 2020 school year where teachers were starting to get the hang of it. They were starting to understand what this looked like a bit. Um, the 2019, 2020 school year was supposed to look a lot like phase three where you had some online learning, some face-to-face -face learning, and depending on what was happening in your local area, you were bouncing back and forth. And that was true for many of us. The difference is, and you'll notice the way it's described there, prepared to fully support. And I think it's that prepared to fully support that really tripped up a lot of, of schools and school districts and jurisdictions, because what ended up happening was that folks didn't prepare in the way in which they should have. Um, so that the past school year for a lot of folks, um, particularly the fall of 2020, uh, was basically just an extension of what they had in the spring. Um, ideally, if you know we had done a good job with vaccine uptake worldwide, 
um, this school year that is about to start in North America. And I know for those jurisdictions that have year-round schooling, you're, um, I guess, getting ready to, um, what are we into, July? So you'd be finishing term two of the 2021 school year. Um, you know, we're start, st supposed to be starting to think about what this new normal might look like. Um, you know, what I guess as the public health folk call living with COVID might look like. But I, I suspect that the school year we're about to see or that we're in now is going to continue to look more like this phase three model. And um, just to give you some, I guess, ideas of what this looked like. And I apologize that these are all North American uh, focused pictures. So it might not be as reflective of uh, your experience. Um, but, you know, this is what we saw a lot of in phase one and phase two. Uh, teachers in front of computers, obviously using this kind of Zoom technology, um, Google Meets technology, and um, using it largely the same way that they would do in a classroom. And you can see they're all sort of, the cameras are all pointed at what might look like a uh, an elementary school classroom in most North American jurisdictions. Um, you know, as we moved into the 2019, or sorry, 2020-21 school year, so last school year, um, we saw a lot of planning where they had models like this, um, but unfortunately, the, the reality was um, most teachers weren't prepared for to be able to teach effectively in that kind of environment. And um, not only that, but we didn't really think through how to go about doing it, which is one of the reasons why it became such an ineffective model of learning and it wasn't just something that really tried on teachers and you can see a couple of the 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 articles that i've pushed there on the um i guess it would be the right hand side of the screen about teachers resigning uh or taking long-term leaves of absenceism teachers feeling burned out having to switch back and forth but it was something that you know impacted the the students in a great deal as well you know you would think that six months in a year into the pandemic that we would have figured out things about you know how to get kids connected so that they you know in the case of the the cnn article at the bottom about the fourth grader walking to school that they didn't have to have a um what's a fourth grader like a nine-year-old walking um over a mile to go back and forth to school just so he could sit outside um and use the wi-fi that was out there uh, the one on the far bottom right corner there, you see there are two kids that are sitting outside of a Taco Bell because Taco Bell has free Wi-Fi. Um, and it's not just, you know, how we, 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 we served these kids and the fact that, you know, as you see from the CNN article at the top, uh, so many of these kids just didn't show up. Um, that you saw these these huge drops in in the school year, but it's the way in which we serve them. So um, here's two that I, I I pulled out, and we hear a lot about the resilience of kids, and and while they can be, um, it's also important to remember that because of the lack of preparation and the inability of so many teachers to really use the tools that were available to them in an effective way. And, and this is not a criticism of the teachers. It's a criticism of the teacher preparation programs that prepared the current for workforce, as well as the schools and school districts that didn't provide adequate professional development and adequate training, particularly when they had a summer to be able to get ready for this kind of thing. Um, but you can see some of the the issues and the, the quote up there from Mary Rice, who's a, a colleague of mine at the, the University of New Mexico, as she's recounting something that happened in her own daughter's class. I mean, when you read stuff like that, particularly, you know, the how it ends there, you know, it, it's really as an educator, difficult to see that kind of thing and knowing that it could have been prevented um, had we had some foresight, you know, and, and beyond just the impact that it's had on, um, on, on teachers and students. When we look at the nature of the curriculum that's being used, um, and I'll drop the um, URL for this one in the chat as well. Um, while most teachers aren't haven't been trained in instructional design and curriculum development and online um, course content development. So, and even if they were having to do that on top of teaching makes it quite difficult and, and oftentimes means that 
um, what's being prepared is quite low quality. So what a lot of schools do is they go and just lease or purchase a curriculum from an online curriculum provider, a vendor, if you will. And we've seen examples of, of how this has been incredibly dangerous. And, and I use the term dangerous very specifically because, you know, if you look at the, the three examples, actually uh, four examples, because the middle one has two in it, you know, four examples of just some of the things that were in the elementary, not, in, you know, this isn't the high school type stuff. This is elementary level, you know, so grade years one through six or grades kindergarten through five, you know, this is stuff that these kids had in their curriculum this past year, right? And and when you look at these examples and you see sort of the egregious nature of, of, of what's in here, you, you start to wonder, you know, what is actually being taught if this is the essentially the base curriculum that's being used to, you know, work with these students. Even if you look at not just the curriculum, but the tools in which we use. So there's a couple of reports here. Here's the, the first one. Um, oops, where am I to there? And then here's the, the second one that's there. Um, but if you look at just the nature of the tools that we use, um, it's something that as educators, A, I don't think we, you know, it, it's necessarily our responsibility to understand these things, but as educational leaders, um, it, it's important to, to know a lot of this information. Uh, so these two reports from the NEPC take a good look at the nature of data collection and, and, and issues around student privacy. Um, when you look at a number of different platforms. And it's really important. I, I pulled out an example here just from Nearpod, uh, which is a presentation software that's been used a lot here, uh, particularly in California where I'm to. In fact, even some of my teachers at, uh, um, here at Tor University, California, uh, are using it. But it, it's an interesting one, and it's certainly not the most egregious one. Um, the one that I always look to, to be honest with you, that I think is, I won't necessarily say the most egregious, but the most nefarious is probably the best way of describing it, uh, is Google Classroom. Um, if you look at Google Apps for Education, the terms of service that are quite educator friendly in the Google Apps for Education suite actually only apply to about a third of the tools that are in the suite. So if you look at all of the tools in the suite, many of them have their own terms of service. And many of those things, uh, many of those terms of services include a lot of data collection about our students that's happening that most teachers don't even realize um, is, is, is going on. Um, even just the nature of, you know, not the data being collected from, by our students, which is bad enough, but the nature of content that you as a teacher might create and the ownership around that or the copyright around that. Uh, we give up things so freely without actually, and I'm as guilty as anyone. I mean, this presentation within an hour of, of actually giving it will be posted to SlideShare. Um, that's the, the, the tool slideshare.net, the tool I use to make all of my PowerPoints available to folks that, um, that attend my sessions, or for that matter, folks that can't attend my sessions. By posting it to SlideShare, I actually give them permission uh, what is essentially joint ownership of my content. Um, and, you know, that's, if, if I want to use their service, that's the only thing that I've got available. Um, you know, and I pull this Nearpod example out because I, I think it's an important one that we don't realize how much of this is in the terms of service. So, again, if you look at Nearpod as an example, Basically, they say that as long as your account is active, so as long as you don't go in and um, specifically delete your account, that they will use all of the personal identifying information that both you and your students use um, in perpetuity. Now, I don't know about you, but um, I can't remember the last time I went into a service that I signed up for and specifically deleted my account. Usually you just stop logging in. Um, in fact, the first time I used this slide in a presentation was about five months ago. And just as a 
um, example, I went to try to find to see if I still had a MySpace account. And sure enough, I can still log into MySpace. Um, it was the first time three months ago or so was the first time in over 12 years that I had logged into MySpace, but I still have a MySpace account. It's still active. It's still there. Any data that they have about me, um, they are still entitled to because at that time I had never deleted my account. And I suspect that's true of most of us, um, you know, that we sign up for these things. And when we decide we're not going to use them anymore, we just stop using them. We actually don't go through because it didn't cost us anything in the first place. We don't go in and actually cancel or delete our subscriptions to these things. So they just sit there. And as long as they sit there, these companies retain the ability to use all of the information that we've collected. And one of the things that we fail to remember is that for companies like Google and Facebook and, and most of these services, to be honest with you, we're not their customers. You know, we're their source of data. We're their widgets, if you will, that they're selling to advertisers and to folks that, you know, want to get access to our data. And that's an important thing to remember because, you, you know, we're all adults. We can make decisions about how we use this information and whether or not we want to you know, use this particular um, service and whether or not we're willing to give up certain uh, rights to our material or our privacy for that. Our students don't get to make that decision. You know, if I'm using Google Classroom or Canvas or Edumanium or, or whomever as, you know, some sort of vendor, my students have to use that. They don't have a choice in the matter. Um, you know, so I'm making the decision to give up my students' privacy. And it, it's an important thing to, to think about, and it's an important thing to consider as we look at some of these tools uh, that we have available to us. So um, I guess looking ahead a bit to the future and where we are going uh, before I turn it open to questions, and I wanted to leave a fair amount of time for questions here. Um, so I, I mentioned this idea of, of the pandemic coming in waves and re us really not knowing um, how it's going to look. Um, this here is the trajectory for the Spanish flu in, in 1918 and 1919. And as you can see, there were three waves that it had. Um, here in North America, we're into our fourth wave with COVID-19, or it's a, depending on, I guess, where you are, we're either starting or into. Uh, so obviously, we've had more bumps with COVID-19. But I, I want to ask the folks, and, and use the chat here, you can see this chart ends in April, well, I guess closer to May of 1919. Does anyone know what happened to the Spanish flu after May of 1919? I'll just pause for a second and let folks type something in the chat if they happen to know. I'm trying to get caught up on my coffee intake while I'm waiting for a response or so. And I'm not seeing anything, so I'm going to assume you guys were in the same boat that I was in about 12, 14 months ago. Um, so apparently, uh, last decade, uh, they were able to, oddly enough, recover, uh, I think it was some World War I um, soldiers that had been frozen into the permafrost in the Alps as part of the, the, the offensive that they were having. And these individuals actually had um, the Spanish flu. So they were able to, to sequence it um, from a genetic standpoint. And it was the first time that, that this had happened. And in the process of doing the sequencing, what they came to learn was that starting in May of 1919, it's not that the Spanish flu actually died out. It just the essentially mutated or the next variant that came through was a variant that really wasn't all that deadly, uh, at least not in comparison to the first three. In fact, the Spanish flu is still with us today. We just call it, uh, you know, it, it's the seasonal flu that happens every year that we get a flu shot for. Um, it essentially mutated and continues to mutate to, to this very day. Um, so here we are, you know, 102 years after this, most people thought the Spanish flu had ended, 
but really it's been something that's been with us since 1918. It's just we got lucky in terms of how it mutated after that third wave. Um, as we're all sort of seeing with this Delta variant that's coming around uh, now, we haven't been as lucky uh, with the COVID. And, and I mentioned that in particular because, you know, we looked at this, um, let me see if I can, you know, this particular chart here and, and what this fourth phase might look like in this new normal. And the reality is, is that depending upon vaccine uptake worldwide, because, you know, this is a worldwide pandemic. Um, phase four actually may look like a continuation of phase three that just keeps going. Because, you know, if we end up in this situation where this particular virus just continues to mutate, and instead of getting lucky, like we did with the Spanish flu, where it mutates into something that, while still quite contagious, is not quite as deadly, um, that hasn't been the case thus far with, with COVID-19. It seems that each mutation is not just more contagious, but more deadly. So this is something that we could be living with for quite some time. And if you look, this is something that, you know, the experts really know they've just been trying to slow play with this. So um, this is Dr. Anthony Fauci, who is, um, was the, the head of the, the NIH Infectious Disease uh, group and I guess he still is, but he's also under the the current president, the new president, uh, Joe Biden, head of the coronavirus uh, response. And in October of last year, so almost a year ago, he was predicting that it would be the end of this year, probably into 2022, before we started seeing some semblances of normality. And that's an important way he put it. You know, it's not like the pandemic is going to be over. It's not like things are going to go back to normal. We're going to see some resemblance of what we used to see. Um, in the case of the, the, the Canadian public health, uh, the top Canadian public health uh, uh, official, uh, Dr. Teresa Tam, you know, in July of last year, so a full year ago, she said that we should expect to live with the current inconveniences for the next two to three years. You know, so this phase three is going to be something that, you know, we're going to be talking about for a long time. And even folks that are just starting their teacher preparation programs now that, you know, might have another year or two or three before they finish and start teaching, in all likelihood, they're going to end up in what is going to be a prolonged phase three before we get to that phase four. So, um, you know, when you look at what's going to happen in the future, we should really be talking short term and long term. So short term, there's a series of questions that whenever I work with schools and school districts that I start asking um, right out of the gate to get them a sense as to where um, they should be. So in terms of their planning preparation, you know, had, we've had two school years now that have been disrupted in some way, shape or form where we haven't been able to cover the complete curriculum. So it's important to know as a teacher, if I could only cover 80% of the curriculum last year, and I'm only going to be able to cover maybe 75 or 80% of it this year, um, and I have 100% of the time, you know, how am I going to make up for that 120%? You know, what stuff can I drop? You know, what, what are the things that are absolutely critical for curriculum continuity purposes that I need to cover? And then what are the things that are just things that are nice to know? Um, you know, have schools actually gone out and looked at the tools that they're using? Um, because oftentimes in these situations, teachers use the tools they're familiar with, but that means that each teacher is using different tools. Um, you know, which are the ones that students are able to use, which are the ones they have problems with, uh, which are the ones they're able to learn from, uh, which ones have the most technical issues when operating from a home environment. This allows schools to sort of collect the data that they need to be able to figure out things like, um, you know, how are we going to train our teachers and, and what tools are we going to use uh, from a modality of learning standpoint, um, you know, looking at issues of device delivery and connectivity. Um, I would actually even take a step back from that and look at the third grouping that I've got there first. Um, you know, we've got over 100 years of experience with other forms of uh, distance delivery other than just the online tools and in jurisdictions where um, the connectivity and bandwidth are a challenge or where you don't have that many devices already in the homes. And we've seen it, you know, 
lots of places in, in North America that look like this. And if you look around worldwide, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, with the exception of, 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 you know, your Western European countries, um, the proliferation of digital devices and reliable connectivity is something that is not widespread in most nations. Um, so looking at how do we leverage some of those older technologies, those jurisdictions that did the best in the past 18 months are those jurisdictions that had a strong tradition of legacy forms of distance education and utilized those. Um, so if you look at Australia, they continue to use a lot of their schools of the air to deliver uh, distance learning for their students. New Zealand and places like Nebraska use their correspondence schools excuse me, extensively. Um, if you look at um, even Los Angeles, uh, they signed an agreement with their local PBS, which is the local public broadcasting system, to essentially have education, you know, instructional television during the day for their learners, recognizing the fact that most homes had a TV, but might not have a computer or digitally a digital device that they could access online learning. And even when you're looking at sort of the the um, you know, the professional development, the things that you know, all of us should know how to do. You know, we should know how to use the tool, but we should also know how to troubleshoot that tool. And then most importantly, we should know how to use the tool to facilitate learning with the age group that we are going to be teaching. And it's that third one that so often we don't get instruction on, we don't get training or professional development on. Um, you know, have schools actually created these types of programs for parents? The role of the parent is very different in this kind of educational context. And even post-pandemic, I think the role of the parent or guardian is going to have changed a great deal in terms of how we look at education. So having them understand what that new role is and how to be able to support it. Um, teaching students, I mean, you guys, you know, aren't that far removed from being K-12 students yourself, much closer than, say, what I am. Um, how much time were you actually given or even how much time your teachers spent on teaching you how to learn in an independent, self-directed, self-motivated kind of way? You know, that tends to be something we don't do in the K-12 system. Um, you know, looking at long term, I mean, there's any sort of number of guesses as to what education could look like five years from now. But I think we can all say that the the fact that we force teachers into this environment um, means that when we get back to whatever that new normal is going to look like, I think you're going to see the integration of a lot of these tools um, and, and the opening up or expanding beyond the, the confines of the four walls um, uh, of classrooms and a, a really a different role between the home and school that we haven't seen. Um, so the types of environments like you see on, on the left side of this, I think are entirely possible. Um, what you see on the right, um, probably not as likely, uh, but you know, is something that uh, a lot of folks have talked about as a, a potential now that we've seen this kind of thing happening. So I've noticed a couple of questions scrolling through the chat and I will uh, try to get to those now, but I've got uh, about 12 minutes here to um, go through. So um, let me scroll back up to the top and see. Um, so the first question I see here is how can we make online learning as effective as classroom teaching? Uh, I think the, the big thing there um, is that we need to make sure that we prepare teachers and also orient students to be able to learn in the online environment in the same way that we've taught them and 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 you know we've taught students and, and trained teachers to be able to teach in the face-to-face -face environment you know i mean i remember going through my teacher ed program and i've taught in several um a number of universities in in, in the u.s and we have like 15 well, depending on the nature of the program, um, you know, 10 to 15 courses on how to teach in the classroom. And then there's one single course that talks about how to use technology. And most cases, it's how to use technology in the classroom, as opposed to, you know, how to use technology to replace the classroom. 
you know, until we get to the point where um, our teacher preparation is spending as much time looking at how we deliver online education as we do how we deliver face-to-face -face education, it's, it's not going to be quite as effective. Um, uh, the next question, what prep, uh, preparedness is required for TPAC integration, uh, especially for teachers? Um, the three things that I, I guess I outlined in those three questions, I think, are, are the key things. Teachers need to be able to use, know how to use the technology to be able to troubleshoot the technology. And then in, particularly important, and this is the one that's often left off, is that pedagog that technological pedagogical knowledge. You know, that third one is the one that so frequently we don't teach, even in that single course that we do offer. Um, you know, we teach them how to use the tools. We teach them, okay, here's, you know, when this goes wrong, this is how you fix it kind of thing. Uh, but we rarely spend much time focused upon on that aspect. Um, uh, the next question, many of my online students uh, leave after 15 minutes of the class. Uh, how can we make students stay in class uh, till the end of class? Um, I, I guess part of that depends upon how you're using the class and if you're using a synchronous or asynchronous modality. Um, so uh, there's a lot of stuff that we can do in a, uh, a synchronous or a face-to-face -face way that is just as effectively done in an online or an asynchronous way. As an example, with the exception of this Q&A that we're having now, everything that I did up until 6.18 my time, um, you know, so everything I did in the first 48 minutes of today's session, I could have just recorded a video and told you to go in and watch it, and then I'll be here for 20 minutes to answer questions afterwards. And you could have done that on your own time and at your own pace, and you would have been able to pause it and rewind it if I said something you didn't get or that you wanted to hear again or interesting. Um, so in that kind of respect, the asynchronous modality might have been more might have afforded you more opportunities to learn than this synchronous modality that we've had. Here. So part of it, I would say, is, is really being selective about how you're using your synchronous and asynchronous instruction and, and actually thinking about, you know, what that means for your students. And, and um, the other thing is one of the things that we've learned from, particularly from MOOCs and, you know, MOOCs for all their, their, their faults, and they have many, uh, one of the things that we have gotten from them is that even an adult who is interested in a particular topic, their attention span tends to be that eight to 12 minute mark, which is why they talk about during in MOOCs, they try to create, you know, all of the videos that are in there to be eight to 10 minutes. Um, most of us don't realize it, but we have the same thing in the face to face environment. You know, and if you think about the way in which you set up a face-to-face -face class, oftentimes we think about it in terms of 15-minute chunks. You know, we're doing this for 15 minutes, then we change, and we're going to, you know, do this for another 10 minutes, then we're going to do this for another 20 minutes, and that kind of thing. And and while we think that way with the on with the face-to-face -face class, we often don't think about uh, the way in which we set up our instruction online in that same sort of format. Um, so those are a couple of things that that I would um, offer up. Um, the next one I see there, parents would still prefer uh, offline classes over online classes for younger kids. How can we make online homeschooling a regular feature? Um, I'll be perfectly honest with you and say that uh, at this stage, I don't think we can. Uh, again, going back to that idea of the amount of training and preparation and planning that goes into face-to-face -face learning, um, that we have built into our system compared to how much of that training and planning and preparation we have for online learning. If I was a parent, would I want my kid to be involved in something that, you know, you've spent 90% of your time getting re ready for or 10% of your time getting ready for? Um, and I think 10% is generous in this respect. Um, you know, I, I want my kid in the environment that you've been trained to do the most. And right now, that's a face-to-face -face environment. Not just what you've been trained to do the most, but what they've been trained to do. You know, from the time we, we get kids in year one or kindergarten, right through to, you know, grade 12 or year uh, 13, we teach them how to have success in a face-to-face -face environment. We rarely teach them how to have say, success in an independent environment, which is why, at least particularly in North America, we, we actually 
have a term for them. They're called December graduates, uh, kids that essentially go off to university in the fall. And by the end of the first semester, even though they did quite well in high school, they flunked out of university by Christmas. And the reason is not that they're bad students. It's just they were never taught how to have success in an environment where somebody's not pushing them and standing over their shoulder all the time, which is what we tend to do in the K-12 system. And we don't do that in an online environment. It's actually quite difficult to do that in an online environment. Not impossible, um, but difficult, and we're never trained to do it anyway. So um, because of that, kids don't have success. Um, so let's see. Can online classes really replace the offline classes in the future? Uh, what would be the best option for future learning after the end of the pandemic? Um, so I'll take those separately because they're a little bit different. Um, online classes can replace offline classes. Um, and I've seen it done with different types of students. Uh, and, and when I say different types, I mean the full range of students. So not just your best and brightest students that are going to have success regardless of the environment they're in. Um, I've seen a lot of students that, you know, um, are the North American term we would use is at risk. I'm not sure if that translates over there, but essentially the students that are in jeopardy of failing or dropping out of school. Um, and the, the key thing for me when I see these programs that are having success is they look at a particular population of students and they say, okay, how can we design a learning experience? How can we design an educational ecosystem around the specific needs of these students? And, you know, that student that's your best and brightest, that's, you know, taking, um, you know, all of these wonderful electives that it literally you could give uh, a copy of the textbook to and say, okay, in four months, you're going to have an exam on this and they do perfectly fine. What they need in that educational ecosystem is very different than the student that, um, you know, struggles from beginning to end and, and really has a, a a difficult time, not necessarily because they don't have the intellectual or academic capability, but just because school isn't set up in a way in which will allow them to learn. You know, the needs of those two groups of students are very different, and you can't design an online system that's going to address both of them. Now, I can design two online systems, one that addresses this kind of student, and one, and I think that's the thing that when I look at how we can go about replacing offline or you know face-to-face -face classes with online experiences um that's really what i'm looking at is is how do we design that and, and if we had more time i could give you a couple of examples uh, from north america that i particularly like but but one i'll mention is the saint Clair county regional educational services um, agency they've got a virtual learning environment that uh, addresses specifically students that are involved with the juvenile justice system and it's a wonderful program that I think is having great success with a really challenging population of students uh, but they're having that success because they looked at that specific population and said okay how can we design an educational environment for those folks now in terms of what this should look like and what learning in general should look like after the pandemic um, I think it's going to look a lot more varied. I mean, we're starting to ask ourselves questions now about things like, you know, does every student need to come to school every single day? And do they need to come equal number of days? You know, so can you have some students that only attend Mondays and Fridays, other students that need to be there five days a week, other students that might need to be there three days a week? Um, how do we set it up so that even if they don't need to be there, that they don't need to be engaged in that classroom-based learning? Um, you know, I was always, uh, as a school student myself, um, I was always strong in the math and sciences, and, and uh, in particular history, just dates seemed to stick to my mind for whatever reason, particularly when I, I heard them. Um, you know, so me being able to sit down and listen to podcasts or videos or whatever you, um, for a history class would have been great. Uh, from English class, I needed to be in that class. I needed to be there with the teacher and stuff um, because that's how, you know, I, I, I struggled more with that. How do we design a, a learning system that allows for that kind of flexibility uh, within the system, I think is where we're moving to going forward. And uh, I see we're just about out of time. And I think that's all the questions that I see in the chat. I don't know if I've missed any. I think you have taken care of uh, all the questions uh, which were there in the chat box. Uh, so I must now thank you once again for uh, 
waking up that early for helping us become aware of online technologies and virtual experiences which is very interesting and exciting so it has given us new ways of teaching online and uh, it has given us the insight how to provide better learning experiences to our students we hope you will uh, join us again and uh, you'll consent to join uh, once the pandemic is completely over and uh, thank you all the participants for participating so well this is dr abha signing off on behalf of td goenka up learn academy stay tuned stay connected stay happy stay blessed keep learning and keep creating thank you very much and if folks didn't get a chance to ask a question or if they think of something after the fact my contact information is there feel free to reach out to me i'm always happy to engage with folks Uh, so don't be shy. Thank you so much. Bye bye.